Okay, let's begin. Small service announcement in the beginning. Um, ein Herr Weißmüller hat etwas auf seinem Zimmer vergessen. Das liegt vorne an der Rezeption zum Abholen dann nach dem Vortrag gerne. Wohl was vom, vom sieht aus wie das Navi von Sixt. Okay, next up is James Fryman with Refactoring Puppet. Enjoy. Hello. Oh, all right. Good morning. That's it? Hey, buddy. Good morning. All right, good. I'm glad everybody's awake. Um, thanks for coming out today. So I want to spend some time talking about refactoring Puppet. It's a little bit question. I want to know, has this ever happened to you? So let's say that you are working on some Puppet code. You're just hacking it out, and you're, you're rocking it, right? And out of nowhere, a wild boss appears. And he comes up to you and says, so we're going to release this brand new like widget 3000 and it's going to be amazing. And it's going to have all these great features and it's going to have social integration and it, we're going to need to scale it because we're going to have like a thousand, hundred thousand users tomorrow. And we need all this infrastructure and we need servers and network and all this stuff. We're launching tomorrow. Problem? <laughs> And you're like, all right, guys, I got this. Don't worry about it, because I use Puppet. So you go back to hacking it. You're working it. Got a deadline. Submit some code, compile it, apply it to your computer, and then you get the purple screen of death. Some dependency error. That sucks. <laughs> so you're like, okay, well, I think I know what the problem is. I've run into this before. So I can, I'm going to fix it. So you go back to hacking it. Work it, work it, work it. You got the fix, you submit the code, apply it to a node, and then, uh, <laughs> So that sucks, right? First of all, sorry, good morning. Don't mean to in introduce like some PTSD this early in the morning. So here's a kitten. <laughs> Calm yourself. Why, why this is interesting? is because as Puppet users, as you continue to grow and scale your, your infrastructure, it's very easy to get started, right? We hear it all the time from community members. You can do a sudo or you can get it installed and implemented very quickly. You can do X, Y, and Z. Well, what they don't talk about is like, what happens a year down the road? What happens two years down the road when you create this massive infrastructure and it does all these great things, but anytime you want to add some code, becomes prohibitive for you because you run into these purple screens of death, right? It happens. Stuff that should be easy becomes very complex. And that's not, um, it's not necessarily a, a function of anybody not doing their job properly or whatnot. It's because what we're doing is we're trying to mature, mature our practices. Um, and that requires us taking a key, taking some, some um, points from the software development community that have been doing this type of thing for years. You know, like 30 years ago, they came up with patterns how to make their code infrastructure more maintainable. And that's what I want to talk about today. So who am I? I'm James Fryman. And you may or may not know this, but I work at this fantastic place called GitHub. Smart people abound. Yet we still deal with these problems. First thing I do when I say, hey, you should refactor, the first question I get is like, why? Why, do you, why should I spend some time refactoring, right? It's just easier to deliver some code. Well, I usually rebut with something like, why do you fix your car? Or, why do you go to the doctor? Or, why do you drink beer? Obviously the third one, right? Who doesn't, right? If you, if you don't, I'm sorry, that's okay. Um, and I have to have an obligatory beer reference in every one of my slides. But the first two are very important, right? We do these things because maintenance is required. We wanna get to our jobs, we, we wanna go to places, we fix our car. We don't wanna die, anybody wanna die? Not me. So we go to the doctor. Code's very much like that. Why do you refactor? Then you get the bean counter guys, and they want to know, well, why is it that I want to spend time on this? So here are some things, like if you're a manager in this room, anybody a manager? OK, good, hi. <laughs> Thanks for coming. If you're not a manager, and you want to go talk to your manager, like, look, I want to spend time doing this, right? He's going to say, why? And you're going to say, well, First of all, it's going to improve my readability. 
And that's really important, right? No one works on a puppet code base alone. Maybe if you're maintaining your own, like, one or two servers or whatnot on your own, you're usually on a team, right? And that requires you to have some modicum of communication skills. If you look at someone's code and you can't really understand what's happening right away, that's a problem. You have to spend time reverse engineering what is already happening so you can add to it, right? You should be able to look at code and understand intent very easily, very quickly. Second thing is like reducing bugs. Ooh, my timing's off, I'm sorry. Let's see, prove readability, reduce bugs. So, oh, apparently my slide's broken. Um, reducing bugs is important, right? So what ends up happening in big code bases is we have all this duplicate code. So you wanna make one change, you wanna make five changes. We gotta go change it like 30 different places. So what inevitably ends up occurring is you create regressions, because you fix it in 30%, 60%, 90%, but there's still issues, right? That's a problem. You don't have to do the same thing over and over again, because let's face it, who's a lazy system administrator? <laughs> right? This is why we use Puppet, right? The third piece is we want to improve velocity. And this very much ties in with being a lazy system administrator, right? How many times have you had to rewrite the same code over and over again in your Puppet code base? Because you haven't abstracted enough. So you're doing the same thing over and over and over again. And that doesn't really tie in with being a lazy system administrator, right? Well, suddenly, if you, ref if you factor your code properly, you can reuse it all the time. And that's more time for beer. <laughs> Who doesn't want that? So you go to your boss and you're like, look, hey, I really want to do these things. And he says, no, you should just go deliver widget 3000. Well, what I usually end up saying to people like that is just, just go do it. Um, and it's important because refactoring is not a project, right? It's not a set amount of time that you're doing something. It is a way of life. We want to embrace it. It is in everything that we do. It's when we write new code, we refactor. When we edit code, we refactor. It becomes something that gets built into our practice. So just do it. Okay, so now you guys are like, okay, I've heard the manager reason. Why do I care? Right? I'm, a, I'm a techie. Why do I want to refactor? Well, again, code reuse, right? That's velocity. And the second piece that is really important is this thing called like isolating change. I think Nigel said it really well. Puppet allows me to break things faster than ever, right? Um, if you can isolate your change to a very small subset of things, because you're no longer having code, spaghetti code, splattered all over the place, like, that helps you not have to fix problems that you just broke, which means more beer time. Um, breaking things down into discrete units of code that you can actually make small changes on is better than jumping into a big file of thousands of lines, trying to edit one or two things, and then crossing your fingers that you didn't break something bigger. It happens, right? I've done it several times. So, so how do we do this? It's all about iteration. So there's a story I like to tell, and it begins with a hammer. A blacksmith friend of mine was telling us how you build a hammer. And you never just start out with a hammer. You have nothing. You start from nothing. And eventually you build the first hammer. I like to call that shipping it, right? You have to get code out. You have to deliver functionality to the business. You have to do something. So you need to get it out there. That's the first hammer. Well, my blacksmith friend says, well, you know, the job's not done after the first hammer. You take that hammer and you use it to build a better hammer. That's the iteration, right? We use tools in order to refactor code, right? We call it, we want to abstract. We want to refactor as you go. And we want to refactor our refactors, okay? These are the concepts we're going to talk about today. Always be abstracting. Always be refactoring. And don't be complacent with your refactors. Refactor your refactoring, because that is equally important that the things that you introduce in order to make your code better also continues to optimize. So ultimately, you take that hammer and you build the best hammer. And that's where we want to get. That's the mecca. That's how you get data-driven infrastructure. We're going to touch on that a little bit today. Um, and again, as a precursor, I'd like to talk about like maturity within IT, maturity within um, system administration, capability maturity model. Um, a group of friends of mine put together this five-level capability maturity model. It starts with level one being hand-edited, right? Who is not using Puppet? Anybody not using Puppet? Okay, 
okay, great. You want to use Puppet because you don't want to be here, right? Um, this, is, this is the snowflake problem, right? We all don't want this. Then the next level of this is like getting things into a central location where maybe you're not managing with a tool like Puppet, but you've got it all in like Subversion or Git or some place where you at least can track changes to what you're doing to your infrastructure. And then level three is configuration management. This is the beginning of how we start to drive toward data-driven infrastructure. This is, I've taken those scripts and I've ported them to Puppet. So now, Puppet is enforcing my state, but it's not doing anything intelligent. It's just still your same scripts, right? Which means you end up with 30, 300 configuration files, all with like single line changes. Um, you end up with um, not necessarily the best code in Puppet that does, you know, I, um, like making sure things are managed properly, but you're better. So you abstract again, and you get to templates. So those 300 configuration files break down into one, some view. You pivot on those. And then finally, you get to data-driven infrastructure, which is where once everything is in templates, you can abstract the data out of Puppet, put it somewhere else like Hiera, and then suddenly Puppet becomes a controller. And now your infrastructure can do really cool things, right? especially when you pair things with like M Collective, where you can say, some event occurred, go build me new servers, go provision things. If the data is abstracted, well, you don't have to worry about where, you know, how you edit your Puppet code. It just happens for you. Code, controller, data, somewhere else. We'll talk about this some more, too. So how do you do this? So there's a couple tools I want to touch on real quick. If you haven't heard of them, great. If you have heard of them, even better, use them. First one is RSpec Puppet. It's written by my, my good colleague, Rajek. And why RSpec Puppet is important is because you get to create tests. Well, I hate tests. And the reason is, you know, I look at, when I first started using RSpec Puppet, it didn't really make sense to me. I wasn't quite sure exactly what I was writing a test for. It felt like I was repeating my effort. I would write, declare something in the catalog, and then I go test the same thing in a different DSL. Seems like a waste of time, right? Well, that's where you're, that's where I love tests, because that's not how you look at RSpec Puppet. You look at RSpec Puppet to do things like um, testing the changes that exist in your, in your, um, your Puppet code. It doesn't matter that you have 300 resources. It matters that on some condition, something else gets applied to those systems. Right? You want to be able to test all of those. You want to be able to have confidence that your code is doing exactly what you expect it to do. That's why you do tests. And in fact, the Puppet Labs guys like it so much, they built it into their module tool generator. So if you use Puppet module, generate a new project. So I'm working on my new project called OctoKittens. It's going to be released in 2014. Um, you're going to get some constructs already, pre-built. Put them in there. Cool, step one. So what does that look like? Here's some code. So in this example, what I'm doing is I'm testing out a definition called log rotate rule. And I'm, we have these let matchers. These let matchers are really great. You can, you can pivot on things like what is the title of your resource, what parameters are you associating with your resource, what facts are being applied to your system. Right? These are the things that you're going to test many different cases of. Right? This is great. And then you have these blocks, right? I want to test, it should include a class. It should include a file with these parameters. So now when you run your test, it's going to compile your catalog, it's going to check against those things, and going to say, look, this is either good or bad. You should know right away. Always write negative tests, too, right? The negative case, who writes puppet modules that install something but don't uninstall? <laughs> OK, right? So you're chuckling. It happens. Me too. It sucks. Um, this is why the negative tests are important, right? Change the parameter, should not. Make sure things are absent, right? You equally want to test that something can come out as easily as it can go in. So you make sure that you are managing the whole life cycle of a project, the whole life cycle of an application, not just the get it on their part. The other thing you want to do is always be testing flow control. This is where our spec puppet really comes into play. It's where you can say something like, here's a fact, okay? And I'm going to pivot based on some of the data there, right? In this case, this is a fact that comes out one of our manifests at GitHub that says, if I'm in the EC2 data center, I want to do use my external endpoint for my app server with some password, some HTTPS, it's great. But if I'm inside and I trust everything, I want to use my internal server. 
right? And then I create my app, um, my file ref, my file resource. This is where the test is important because I want to make sure that in both of those cases, what gets applied to the system is what I intend. So in this example, we're saying on internal nodes, do one thing. On external nodes, do another thing. Now, I had to rip out a little bit of code here in order to make it fit on this slide, but this is where like let matchers come in. When parameter, when my fact of data center is this, I expect X. When it is this other thing, I expect Y. You want to test those things. The other thing, the other great tool is this thing called Vagrant. Hey, who's heard of Vagrant? Excellent, fantastic. I kind of have a man crush on Mitchell H for creating Vagrant. Um, don't let him hear that. Can we edit this out? Yes, okay, good. Um, I kind of have a man crush on Mitchell because this tool is fantastic. Our spec puppet solves half of the problem where I can test the intent of what's going to get installed on a system. Vagrant allows me to actually check what got installed on the system, right? Is my application actually running? Well, Puppet wants to do that. Did it actually happen? Right? There are many times when you have an intent of a catalog that doesn't actually match what actually occurs on the operating system. So you use tools like Vagrant, because you don't want to be this guy that does things live in your production environment. Who tests Puppet live in their production environment? I, always, I also do that. Right? So um, I don't want to be that guy. You don't want to be that guy either. OK. So we talked about a little bit of tools. What is it that you care about? What are you looking for in your code? Big concept out of the Rails community, big concept within software development is this idea of keeping things dry. Don't repeat yourself. So we're gonna talk about two methods that occur within refactoring called extracting and moving. Subtle differences between what actually we do as, a, as an action but matters. Extracting is it takes something out of a module and, and create its own functionality. Moving may be just shifting it around. We'll talk about the difference there. And the best place to start is where are you duplicating your code? So I like to use this tool called Simeon. Uh, it is open, it is not open source, so I kind of hesitate to put it in here, but it's one of the only tools that does a good non-token based analysis of code for Puppet. We're not there with the ecosystem where we can actually tokenize our code. We'll get there. But for right now, I can just do, it is most of the time good enough to be able to do raw text matching. So here's a client that I used to work at. I had 13, 1,300 files. In those 1,300 files, 28,000 duplicate lines of code. How many bugs is hidden? How many bugs are hidden in there? A lot, right? That's a problem. We don't want that. So identify where you have these duplicate code blocks and figure out how to fix that. So what happens, what happens? What are the common things that you see? What are the things you should be looking for? Well, I went to go try to figure out like an image for this to try to you know, display and convey commonality. Well, Google would have nothing of that because every time I started to look for concepts, this guy kept coming up. Common the rapper. There's a rapper named Common, no idea. So, in, in honor of the Google overlords, um, common is now in my presentation, because there's no way they could have found anything else. Every search came up with this guy, so to, to Google. But here are the things that happen, right? Duplicated logic. I have a small block of code that tests for a condition, and I'm just going to copy-paste that somewhere else, and then somewhere else, and then somewhere else, and then somewhere else until you have it like 30 places. Well, what happens when that condition changes? Oh, crap, 30 places to change it. Oh, I forgot one. Oh, that sucks. Oh, a bug. Don't want that. The other thing is like duplicated configuration files. This goes in again with the, the capability maturity model, right? So as you're starting to drive toward data-driven infrastructure, you want to be able to use these templates. You want to be able to, to pivot on some bit of code within that template to actually apply the intent of, of the application. Right? So we want to start abstracting the templates, taking those 30 configuration files and making one, creating a pivot point. Talk about that some more. The other thing is duplicated tests. I put that in there just because three looks good on a slide as opposed to two, but really these are the things that matter. Duplicated logic and duplicated configuration. If you're doing tests, you'll see that. You're already one step up if you have duplicate tests, but it's better to have duplicated tests as opposed to not. So, so here's an example. 
let's extract some code. So here's this code block I talk about, right? You may have this very small selector. It does one thing. No problem. No harm, no shame. I haven't copied it. I'm going to copy it, and I use this same pattern 30 different places. It's just as easy enough to take this and abstract it into a different layer within Puppet. Okay? In this case, I'm going to create a fact based on this same value that I've got here. Right? I'm checking a value already, and then I'm applying it as an as a, um, instance variable. Instead, abstract that into a, um, a either a method or a fact as appropriate. Right? And then I can use this cool thing. Right? Now my code becomes significantly readable. Right? Well, should I monitor? Right? Naming your method names, naming your facts that describe intent. It's very easy to take it an extra step because now when I look at this, I understand intent immediately. I don't have to think about it. I can just say, should this be monitored? Right? And rely on my code, rely on those tests to actually tell me if that's the case. Now I don't have to think about it. I've delegated that responsibility. Because otherwise, oh, that's readable. Awesome. OK. I think the timing's off on that. We'll fix that. Because otherwise, that's readable. Because yeah. otherwise, you get this. Like, how many has like, really crappy variable names in their code? Right? You see this, and you go, I don't know what the heck that means. And you got to go think about what that means. You got to do some reverse engineering. And that's time. That's beer time you're wasting. Right? No. So. Having clear intent, clear intent in how you write your methods helps out. The other piece is like using this concept of partials within your template. So this, they do this all the time in the Ruby community, all the time in the Rails community. Right? So instead of creating like many templates, you can start to do cool things like calling the template function within a template and saying, if a condition exists, let's say I have an SSL code block here. And for my Apache module, if SSL exists, I want to apply this very small sub subset of configuration. Instead of having one configuration file for your non-SSL, one configuration file for your SSL, instead you can create a very small code block. Again, delegating responsibility to the smallest possible denominator. And then creating a pivot based on that in your templates. Right? Makes your code readable, maintainable, life is good. The other thing is like this concept of MVC. This is an old concept, right? Software developers have been using this for a very long time. We can do the same things in Puppet that's pretty cool, right? Some data repository somewhere. Maybe it's Hiera, maybe it's PuppetDB, maybe it's your own custom homegrown CMDB. I know it's a dirty word, but you know, they exist. Then using Puppet as the actual controller, applying intent to your systems into some view your template, what actually gets applied on the system. So you may see this pattern a lot. Package configuration service, all the time in the community. Well, I like to take it a step further. And one of the th problems that you see is these long running parameter lists. So who's downloaded a module from the module forge or from GitHub? It has like 300 different parameters that before you can even start using it. It kind of sucks, right? Because even when you're writing the module and you're maintaining that module, anytime you add a parameter, now you've got to figure out how to like, structure the rest of the code to be able to take that parameter. Again, that's beer time. So I'll, I'm playing with this new methodology. It's kind of evolving. To the thing like actual params, like creating an actual API specification for a given module. And in those case, I can just pass in some structured data. Who knew Puppet took caches? Anybody? Yeah, a couple people. Really interesting, right? So what if I had a set of structured data that defined all of the things that I care about, right? And now I just pass that structured data around and use it. Now I don't have to worry about maintaining my module. And in the different pieces where I want that data, I just grab it in that functionality, in that module piece, as opposed to add a parameter, check the parameter, add a parameter, check the parameter. Not fun. And then you take it a step further, right? So this is the params class. This is where we start to like modularize the data, put the, the actual data somewhere else. And once you level up, you can start to do cool things like Hiera and use some other backend to populate your data. So again, this just becomes another controller, your interface into the data, 
which then passes data around to the other controllers, things like your package, things like your configuration, things like your service management, life becomes good. The new thing is like modularizing your code. Long running classes suck. Um, I like to make sure that if I'm editing some file or I'm creating some file, then that file is under a certain number of slides, right? Um, or a certain number of lines of code. Um, what that also allows me to do is cool things like this, is create associations between entire classes, entire modules, as opposed to individual resources, because that sucks, right? That's how you create spaghetti code. If in what module X, you create a very specific file resource, uh, declaration to another thing. Now when I have to go edit something, I have to understand inherently the code. I have to understand both modules of what they're doing. I can't abstract. I can't delegate that responsibility. Which means now when you hire somebody new, when you're editing something, you have to understand the entire code base. Right? How long does that take? Sometimes a long time, especially when you get very complex infrastructures. Right? You want to be able to delegate responsibility to an individual class assert that it's doing what you expect it to do and create relationships between them, not between individual resources. Because otherwise you end up with this, and that sucks. I always do one manifest, it has one task, it has one purpose. So here's an example of, of my most popular module. I, I don't know why people continue to use it because um, it's got some older concepts in it, and I'm, I'm pleased with it, and I like to use it to illustrate how I like to break out things. Right? Configuration, my pivot point and my init, different manifests, different files per function. Right? One resource at, uh, attribute, I'm going to add a vhost, I'm going to mod modify some upstream, and then even down here, I have all my templates broken out into very small specific pieces. So when I edit one thing, I'm limiting my scope, my risk, to a very small piece. If I break something, I don't break everything. I break this small thing. And that helps me, like, as my propagation of my puppet code goes around, I can feel a little bit better about if something breaks, like, I know exactly what's going to break. I don't have to go reverse engineer what broke. And that allows you to do cool things like sharing. And sharing is, again, another concept where you start to become a great lazy admin. And exec blocks are really good for this. Now, I see a lot of exec blocks in code that are either duplicates or small modifications of things. Um, and this is how like, the evolution begins from something that I need to get done to a type and provider. You have an exec block. And the first thing you want to do is understand, like within here, the options that you use most often. And abstract it. Create a defined type. So in this previous example, I have some file that I'm downloading. I have from some source, and I have it create some file. It's very easy to abstract that to have a defined type with some attributes. And now I have this wonderful, fantastic, reusable code that I can put anywhere. And again, this is very readable, right? Go get this file, download it. Here's the source. Done. Life is good. And this is how the level up. Once you have a defined type that's working well, then you, then you can create it into an actual type and provider and get some of the even more power of Ruby behind you. You know, I know it's very easy to get started with Puppet, but as you grow, if you don't know Ruby, this is how it gets better, right? This is how you start to make your infrastructure better, is by leveling up that skill. So if you don't know Ruby at this point, I highly encourage it. It's not required, right? But it's very helpful. The last piece is modularization. So how do you break up your code? Like, I've got all these modules. How do I organize them? So I like to do it this way. I like to create layers, where at the bottom I have some sort of infrastructure prerequisite, stuff that has to happen everywhere before everything happens. File, re file repositories, apt-get updates, the stuff that's required to bootstrap everything else. The next layer being infrastructure. This is the stuff that has to go everywhere, kind of like a base node definition. I expect this stuff to be everywhere. And then you start to layer the things on top of that. The actual application. The application may be made up of many different smaller modules, but they're individual discrete units. And then on top of that, I layer my actual configuration. Notice that up until the very top layer, there is no code that's specific to my organization. This is the stuff we want. This is how we grow and this is how we mature. We share, right? This is the module forge. 
This top layer is where I put my magic sauce. Everything up until this point should be completely shareable. This is what we want to strive for. Now, this is by far the ugliest slide on my deck because I couldn't figure out how to display this information very well. So, sorry, here's a puppy. But here's this, here's this in practice. So I have my application, my website, and my website requires maybe an Nginx module, maybe some Rails functionality, maybe a SQL, right? This is my app layer. Then here's my infrastructure layer where I have common packages, common libraries, maybe some Ruby, some administrative functions, stuff I expect everywhere. And then at the very bottom, the stuff that has to bootstrap everything else. Kind of flows up nicely. Again, my application specific code is at the very top. It's a separate module on its own that shares from functionality from each of these other smaller units beneath it. It's no longer one big monolithic module. It does many things. So let's wrap this up. Why do you refactor? Well, I refactor again because it improves readability. Right? We saw that having your code specifically readable to describe intent is great. You understand what's happening. You don't have to reverse engineer. More beer time. You reduce bugs. You reduce bugs by limiting the amount of duplication that exists, by limiting the potential for errors across your code base, right? Reduce the risk, reduce the bugs, and then improve your velocity, right? Lazy admins of the world unite. All of this is good. Yes, okay. The last piece, I know Nigel already pimped this book, but I like to pimp it. As you kind of grow your, your defined types and, as, and whatnot, this is a great book. This uh, Puppet Types and Providers book absolutely kind of demystifies some of the internals of Puppet. Grab it. If you haven't read it, it's very small. It's like 60-some pages. Very quick read. Helps you really understand what's happening within Puppet. Highly recommend it. Great book. And I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but I really like talking about refactoring Puppet. I like talking about Puppet. I like talking about how to make people's lives easier. So if you want to talk about that, contact me. And reach me as Jay Fryman on Twitter and GitHub. If you still use this IRC thing, I'm known as James Fryman on Freenode. I hang out on the Puppet channel all the time. Throw a mention out, my phone will buzz. Could be 3 a.m. in the morning for me, whatever. I like to talk about Puppet. And if you have to use this archaic thing known as email, you can hit me at fryman at github.com. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and see if you guys have any questions. How yes, sir. How do you know a blacksmith? <laughs> the question was, how do I know a blacksmith? Well, I, I belong to this uh, terrorist cell, and uh, no, I, I don't know. It's a friend of a friend thing, so. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Um, these slides are already available online. You can go to speakerdeck.com slash jfryman slash refactoring dash puppet. Um, I, I believe also the organizers are going to share the, uh, share the presentation as well. So don't worry about writing it down. It is already available online. Happy to share it. What else? Nothing. Is it too early? I, I can do the presentation again. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. So we have, um, oh, I'm sorry, yes, yeah. The question was, are we doing um, continuous integration on our Puppet code? Well, it, you know, if you're, if you're doing tests, it kind of lends itself to do that, right? Um, within, specifically within GitHub and other um, practices that I've used, um, every commit, every code commit, right, with the power of, of Git and GitHub, we have these uh, post-receive hooks that tie in directly to our con continuous integration servers. So on every commit, I can tell very quickly is my code passing? If it doesn't pass, don't release it into the production. Right? We even have blockers into merging into our production environment if it doesn't pass the test. Basically, we get yelled at. No, it does not work. Right? Oh, you reintroduced a regression. That sucks. Don't merge. So yeah, like, I, I wholeheartedly believe in continuous integration, right? especially as we develop our practices as this concept of infrastructure as code. Right? We're no longer pointing and clicking. Right? This is how we create accountability for ourselves. This is how we give confidence to our bosses. This is how we deliver like, velocity. This is how we go to beer time. Absolutely. Use tests. Yes, sir.
uh, we often got the problem that the, the class or the, the other module is completely applied before the next, the main module is what we're in public. Okay. Um, so, so the question was, let me make sure I understand. So if I have many different smaller modules and I need to have some ordering occur so that, let's say, my, um, I don't know, my SQL's installed before my application gets installed because I have to bootstrap some schema, right? Like I need to ensure that ordering. This is where that class-based um, declaration comes in handy. Um, you may or may not have, anybody heard of the anchor pattern? Okay, a couple people. I think I actually have a slide on that. Let's go back to it. Whee! Okay, so here, right, I create this anchor pattern where basically I'm initializing some amount of options, right? I want my package to be installed. I have some configuration. And then I have a service that's being managed by Puppet. All of this, right, so I'm using the uh, short ordering dependency um, arrows. There's a name for them, I know. But at the very bottom here, I'm actually anchoring back to the class itself. So in the, in the graph, in the director graph, what ends up happening is that these individual discrete units end up floating off each other, right? Just because they're namespaced properly, the same, doesn't mean that they stay together, right? Those, those different discrete units kind of float off in the graph. By anchoring it back to this individual class, this class level, that's why I can do, no, 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 okay. <laughs> This, right? I can take and create associations with an entire class, right? So now I can say, go install X, but I want to make sure that the NTP server is installed. Go install Y, but the MySQL server needs to be bootstrapped continuously, right? If you use the anchor pattern and take advantage of that, it's very easy to create that ordering. And a good manifest, right, a good kind of site or node manifest basically has, I want to do one, two, three, here's the ordering in which it happens. Right? Sometimes ordering is less important, like um, that package can get installed anytime. It's just I want it to be there versus this ordering must occur. Right? Using the anchor pattern allows you to be, be able to create those associations very easily. Again, without creating spaghetti code to individual resources. You don't want to do that. What else? Yes, sir. Continuous integration, so what kind of tool are you using for your puppet continuous integration? We use um, Jenkins. So Jenkins, basically, um, we have some post commit hooks, or post receive hooks. Um, and then there's a script associated with that. And Travis CI, right, you can use those um, if you just want to like, get started today. Right? They offer a free service, they offer a paid service. And then even if you want to level up, right, create your own testing infrastructure, it's very easy to set up Jenkins. Um, I think there's actually like puppet modules to do that. Go figure, right? <laughs> um, but yes, Jenkins, that's what we use. Yes, sir? What underlying mechanism to roll back changes? I mean, you use the vagrant form or change the for the Yeah, so the question was what mechanism do you have to roll back changes, right? So again, I think there's a layered approach that's associated with that. First approach being one, can your code uninstall something as easily as it can install something? Uh, with respect to continuous integration. Rollback of? Yeah, if you apply some module on, on uh, with Puppet to test it, mm -hmm. you have to undo these changes again, steps again. Maybe I, I'm sorry, maybe I don't understand the question. If, if, if I have continuous integration and there's, is a failure within the test or? Oh, oh, that's all handled by Jenkins, right? So, so um, Puppet, our spec Puppet does a pretty good job of, I'm sorry, the question again is like, how do I, how do I like reset an environment for when I'm doing uh, changes? Our spec Puppet does a pretty good job of isolating individual units based on like the let matchers. So it's going to actually compile a c catalog for each of those states, right? And since Puppet is very much declarative and, and idempotent, uh, state is kind of this, concept we can kind of throw out with the bathwater a little bit, right? Um, I'm going to set all these different variables, and then I'm going to get a new catalog for each of those conditions. So as far as, you know, Travis CI is concerned, each test is almost like a new environment for itself. And our spec puppet does a lot of stuff on the inside to make sure that it doesn't take forever. So. It also it doesn't apply the catalog. It just builds it. It just builds the catalog, too. Yeah, that's a good point. So just building the catalog and testing against that versus, like, actually applying it to a system. So we're not doing, like... Um, actual like acceptance testing. It's just kind of testing the intent. Is it doing what I expect it to do? And then on the flip side with Vagrant, 
Like, there are some work, like I've, I've had some conversations with it, and you've probably seen it in the community on, how do we actually test what it got applied to the system? There's some cucumber stuff going on with that, there's some vagrant stuff, still very immature, right? Um, but we'll get there, like, and it'll get to the point where we're like, test intent, test what actually happened, life is even better, so. Okay, thank you, James. Thank you very much.